Welcome to week two in researching history in Australia. This week we're looking at traces of the past. So essentially, who leaves what, where. Now this is a subject about research. Last week we talked about some of those aspects that lie behind research. This week I want to talk about the things that fuel it, which means how do you find sources, how do you extract information from them. Now there's a risk that some of you may have limited your research in previous subjects to Google. And to be perfectly honest, you'd have reasonable company. Uh, some Dutch academics published an article which suggested a whole lot of academics resorted to just Googling it. But in history, that's not really enough. In some ways, that search engine is too limited. In others, it's far too broad. Not everything that is relevant pops up high in a Google search. And in a Google search, there is an awful lot of clutter, which may prevent you from reaching the stuff that's relevant. And I have to say that even when you know something is out there, it can be difficult to locate it using Google because it's located within a collection and Google doesn't really master the process of delving in to the indexes and records of what those places hold. Now I'm hoping, this being a history subject, that many of you have done research that has taken you away from your computer screens. I know there's amazing stuff available online these days, but there's also amazing stuff which isn't, and stuff that is contained within the James Cook University Library. And having a sense of what is out there is really important to being a researcher. I refer to it as having twitching little fingers, and I admire people who have that twitch and can locate sources which aren't immediately obvious. It's something that comes from experience. Sometimes it comes down to luck or to serendipity or to talking to librarians and archivists who know what are in their collections and who can give us guidance. Sometimes it also comes down to a sense from other sources that you're reading of what might be out there. I'm sure that you have in your previous subjects mind footnotes and bibliographies. I really hope you have, that you've been and you've had a look. If somebody says something that's really relevant and there's a footnote, that you have looked at the sources that that footnote refers to. And if they're primary sources, that you've tracked them back and possibly also had a look at those. It's one of the things that historians do. And in the present, there's an amazing tool on Google Scholar where you can actually mine footnotes forward. So you can look at citations. If there's something that's really central to what you're looking at, but it was published a little while ago, you can go to Google Scholar and look there to see what has referenced it. So you can look not just in the footnotes of the thing you're reading, but in where it itself has become footnotes to future scholars. So there are wonderful tools, there's amazing stuff to find. And this lecture is an attempt to help you develop that twitch. It's useful also in terms of current interest in data, that you can bend your mind around what kind of things you might be able to find, place them in context and make use of them. So it's about not just what's out there, but what use can you make of it? And I think this is a great skill that historians have. What can the evidence tell us that it might not be immediately addressing? Now, if you experienced my lecture on nationalism and HI2001 global history, you'll know that I have an awkward relationship with it. Nationalism makes me uneasy, but nationalism requires historians and it supports us by creating national institutions, particularly of the kind that I like you to do research in. So while I have an uneasy relationship with nationalism, I love the institutions that it produces and the collections it creates and the way that they allow historians to get on with doing their work. And here's an image of the National Library of Australia, a building and a collection that I would happily spend a lot of time in. It contains a copy of everything published by an Australian publisher after 1912, and some other things besides. But by law, from 1912 onwards, Every Australian publisher had to deposit a copy 
of everything they published. So it's an amazing collection. The institution itself is consciously modeled on libraries overseas. National libraries are things that nations value. And so there are some amazing collections around the world. I'm lucky to have worked in the National Library of New Zealand. I've been to the British Library. I've been to the National Library of Scotland. It's a sign. Having a national library is a sign that a nation is for real. And they tend to be well supported and have wonderful collections. And as part of the glam sector, they also tend to be beautiful buildings in great locations. And the National Library of Australia is no exception to that. Now you may already have had experience with the National Library of Australia, even from Townsville. If you've used Trove, that resource that I mentioned last week in the lecture, then you've experienced something of the National Library of Australia and you've also experienced something of its commitment to a national endeavour, to a national collection and to national access to that collection. Here is an infographic by the library making the point that its collections are not just for people in Canberra, that it's supposed to be a national library and that it attracts researchers and research requests from around Australia. It also has some information about the extraordinary extent of its collection. As it says there, it has a total shelf length or collection spanning 261 kilometers. And that'll be greater now because this information is a little bit dated. And the major way that the National Library reaches out across Australia is through that online project, Trove. It's an interesting project. It's a recent project. I can remember the days before Trove, and I'm old enough that I remember some of its precursors. It used to have Picture Australia as a separate site. Now that's bundled it. It used to have newspapers as a separate site, and that project started in the first decade of the 21st century. Now, the National Library of Australia is not the only national library, national institution to reach out in this way and to try and digitize and make available its collections. This is a really useful thing to know. So actually the National Library of New Zealand, Te Puna Mataranga o Aotearoa, has a slightly older newspaper digitization project, which was called Papers Past. Other national libraries also have these projects going. Some of them, unfortunately, are hidden behind paywalls. Some of them require you to be of the nation that they're part of. Trove, Trove Australia, the open accessibility of that site, which is also the case with the National Library of New Zealand's online resources, it's a little bit exceptional and it's absolutely wonderful. But it's always worth checking now. If you are interested in history beyond Australia's shores, it's no longer an absolute requirement that you get on a plane and go and do a desperate short-term dive into an archive overseas. It is possible that you can access newspapers and all sorts of other resources from your computer. This is an extraordinary part of history research. It's something that's changing and that you've got to keep your eye on. And again, it's that twitching of the fingers. You've got to have a sense of what might be possible so you can check whether it's actually happened. So is it worth looking for newspaper archives online from these other places? And in the second part of this lecture too, I'll talk about collections beyond national collections and how amazing they are. Now Trove is great and part of the reason it's great is that it acts as an aggregator which is something that you might not be thinking of when you think of the National Library of Australia. You can see a mention on the slide to the 2017 Trove Roadshow. That Trove Roadshow was very interesting and it served two purposes. The first purpose was to demonstrate to interested parties around Australia, and clearly I was an interested party in Townsville, but to demonstrate to interested parties around Australia that funding cuts had not killed Trove that tribe was still functioning and still expanding. And it is. And it is expanding all the time. So that was its first purpose. The second purpose was to serve that expansion. It was seeking 
to partner with other heritage organisations in order to make their collections discoverable, even if they weren't necessarily accessible online. So it was reaching out to other heritage organisations. And if those other heritage collections had some or all of their collections digitised, then it was offering to connect up with them. But even if their collections weren't digitised, it was offering to make them discoverable so that their catalogues might be accessed by people searching through Trove. And so Trove is expanding the material that you can find out about within it is constantly increasing. You might still have to go to another archive, to another repository, to actually look at what you've identified through Trove. It's like going into the library catalogue and finding a book that you need to go to the shelf for, as opposed to a book that's digitised and online. But to know that these things exist is half the trick. And for us in North Queensland, it's wonderful that this access to national collections and to collections scattered across Australia is increasing and that we can manage research without necessarily having to pay the expenses of travel. The National Library holds a range of items. So I've mentioned that it has newspapers and digitised newspapers are amazing. For copyright reasons, most access is only to copies up to 1955. Some periodicals have given copyright permission to the National Library that they can be accessed beyond that. When you watch the City Libraries tour, there's a discussion in there about how those periodicals past the copyright cliff are still available. There are other digitisation and paywalled digitisation projects, but they tend to reach back only as far as the 1990s. So between 1955 and 1990, there's that dark age where you need to go to microfilm readers. But once you work out how to operate microfilm readers, those newspapers are accessible to you. Not quite the range you get through Trive because you are limited by the holdings in the JCU Library, in City Libraries Townsville, in the Cairns Public Library system. But there are still options. And it's an interesting thing to watch because historians are so enamoured of Trove, those periodicals that have given copyright permission for use in Trove are getting cited at a tremendous rate, partly because we've had enough experience of microfilm readers to know that digitisation makes life much easier for us. So I've spoken about that, I've spoken about images, and again, the range of images that are available online now is amazing and is constantly increasing. Collections are putting more and more material online. We will talk in this subject about copyright restrictions on using that material, but for viewing it, that's still a major source of information for us. And it is a major change since I was an undergraduate student. Appreciate it. So these things I've mentioned, there's a range of other material as well. There are published books, all those books the publishers had to send to the National Library of Australia. And let me tell you, the National Libraries get quite assertive. They don't pursue just commercial publishers for their output. They pursue enthusiast publishers as well. So there are published books. I mentioned the newspaper. It's one of the great things in Trove at present is the Australian Women's Weekly, which has given massive permission for digitisation. Walkabout, another important Australian magazine, is also being digitised. And again, those different periodicals, many of them accessible through Trove, some with their own websites and archives, are coming online more and more. So there's a wealth of information there. The National Library also holds more personal items, things like diaries and letters and ephemera, and whatever has been seen as being in the national interest for the library to collect. Or private collectors have seen it as being in the national interest in their duty to donate to the library. So it extends beyond just that published material, which has to be included. And the library isn't the 
only national institution of memory. It's not just those 261 kilometres of shelves that holds the memory of Australia. Here are some other ones. And some of these will be familiar to you. Uh, if you're intrigued by the image on the right, I've put up a link so that you too can construct your Lego Canberra. It's an interesting comment on nationalism and the significance of the national capital that this has been produced. I know about it because it visited Townsville. There was an exhibition in the public library to which I took my son and watched him construct not actually national monuments. He declined to follow the instructions. I built the National Library though. And the National Capital Authority is funded by the government to promote the idea of Canberra as a significant site and as a heart of the Australian nation. And so there are these other institutions there. The National Maritime Museum is slightly different in that it's on the coast at Sydney. But these other national institutions are all located in that national capital because the nation sees its memory and this construction of the nation through archives as an important part of the Australian project. But these institutions don't mark the limits of official record keeping. And in many ways, they're replicated at state level. But that's a little problematic. If you look at this diagram, I'd hope as historians that you're aware that the borders of states haven't always been where they are now. New South Wales used to include New Zealand. This diagram shows you those shifting borders. And in Australia, the holdings of the state memory institutions reflect the previous colonial boundaries and previous administrations. So material that relates to Queensland before Queensland separated from New South Wales is held in the state institutions of New South Wales because it relates to what was New South Wales at the time. There are all these little quirks about where things are held. If you're researching Northern Territory topics, then you need to consider not just the Northern Territory archives, but also the South Australian archives, because the Northern Territory used to be the Northern Territory of South Australia. Not only that, you need to consider the National Archives because it comes to be administered from Canberra. And you can push this back even further because Australian material is also found outside Australia. So New South Wales holds a whole lot of material which relates to areas that are now in Queensland because it used to administer them. Well, Britain used to administer Australia. And so there are a whole lot of records relating to Australia held within British archives. This was recognised by historians as an issue. Those records are held by all sorts of entities in Britain. And because it was a problem, there was a project to solve it. The Australian Joint Copying Project aimed to make those records accessible to historians of Australia without requiring them to make that expensive journey to Britain to consult the archives. That project was in operation from 1948 through to 1997, and more recently, the material that has been collected from British archives has been digitised. There has been a whole project about that. You can see the link at the bottom which describes it, which has been completed. And so they've digitised the microfilm that was created between 1948 and 1997. And that brought home Australian related records from entities such as the Admiralty, the Home Office, the Colonial Office, the Dominions Office, and other personal archives and manuscripts, which were held in the United Kingdom. And returning to this slide, there's a wealth of information within these archives. It's not that easy to engage with the material held in the archives, as opposed to the library. But it's possible. There is an online search interface. It tends to take a little bit of time to work out what files are useful because the National Archives, the State Archives, 
are organised to suit the politicians and the government entities using them, not to suit future historians of what they're doing. Their organisation isn't always straightforward and it doesn't lump together the kinds of things that we want to look at. Instead, they sort records according to how the politicians wanted to operate. And politicians are keen to have their activities recorded. Parliamentary proceedings have their own set of records, which I'll come to in the second part of this lecture. Governments are also fond of royal commissions, which is a well-recorded investigation into a particular topic and again yields extraordinary records when it's on something that you're actually interested in from a range of experts who have come to testify to that particular royal commission. It's extraordinary what records are held. Sometimes access isn't straightforward. You may remember the kerfuffle a few years ago about access to the palace papers. So to the records of information exchanged between the Governor General of Australia and the Queen around the dismissal of Gough Whitlam's government. Some of those records are not accessible to historians yet. Every year at the start of the year there are newspaper articles about what's just been released because it does work on date, although even when the date is reached things can be held back. For various reasons. Reasons of national security. Uh, some records have a longer time to expiration than others because of the sensitivity of the matters they deal with. So while these national institutions of memory are amazing, the archives in particular are organised to serve the purposes of government, not simply to support historians. But this is where I'm going to finish up. I hope that I haven't actually inspired you to go and build your own Lego Canberra. I hope instead I've inspired you to start thinking about where information related to things that you might be interested in could be held and to start exploring the online archives that are available, not just the ones for Australian material, but to go and have a look, possibly go and trawl through the Library of Congress. They have amazing things the British Library, they've got a whole lot online too, and start getting a sense of what is accessible in the age of the digital, even as travel to distant archives has become so much more difficult.